We've just entered the final saga of One Piece, and that means the biggest mysteries of One Piece will be finally solved. However, given One Piece's length and complexity, if you're not a hardcore fan, it might be easy to forget many of the smaller plotlines and characters Oda has established across the years. So I'm here to organize and summarize everything to remind you about all the important things you need to remember that will play into the final saga of One Piece. So for starters, let's do a quick check on the most important events for the final saga. The Reverie. During the last Reverie, as we saw in the manga, many characters we know gathered at the Reverie, but several incidents that took place there have shaken the world in many ways. The easiest way to characterize these incidents is to go over the headlines that Morgans mentioned in chapter 956. It's also worth mentioning that the government attempted to cover up a certain article, but Morgans refused to do it and was published anyway. But we don't know which of the articles it really was and why the government wanted to cover it up, considering they already seemingly covered up the truth about Cobra's murder. Regardless, these are the five key events of the Reverie. First, the main event is that the Revolutionary Army infiltrated into Marijua to declare war on the Celestial Dragons for the corruption they have brought onto the world as well as to rescue the now-slave Kuma from their clutches. During this event, they clashed against Admirals Fujitor and the Okugyu, but managed to get safely away. Following the separation of the revolutionaries as they fled Marijua, Saba was reported to have assassinated King Cobra from the Alabasta Kingdom, which prompted the Eight Nation Revolution, an event where eight countries affiliated with the world government took advantage of their missing rulers during the reverie to take control of their nations, such as what we saw happen in the Lalasha Kingdom. These people began to hail Sabo as the godlike flame emperor in Tei. However, some found it odd that Sabo would perform such a murder against someone who was considered by many to be a kind ruler of a peaceful country, but Sabo clarified that he was framed for the murder by the government and implied that he find out about the existence of King Emu and that Emu might have been the real killer of King Cobra. After all, Cobra had an interest in the true history that Robin alluded at, wondering what the purpose of Alabasta really was, and the Gorosei saw this as a threat, especially given his Celestial Dragon bloodline. Similarly, Vivi herself has ended up disappearing, and publicly it is not known where she ended up, with even the Marine Investigation Department still trying to find a link between the two incidents. However, we know that King Emu seems to have taken an interest in Vivi for some reason. This is no small matter, as Emu discarded away pictures of Luffy, Blackbeard and Shirahoshi, all figures very integral to the future of the world, one of them even an ancient weapon, but only decided to keep Vivi before presumably kidnapping her. What purpose does Emu really hold for Vivi? Wampo also gave Morgans a certain news tip which could perhaps be the disappearance of Vivi, though we don't really know if this was indeed the article he was informed about. There is also the attempted murder of Saint Charles the Celestial Drown from Sabaody, where the perpetrator was able to escape thanks to the help of Saint Miosgard, the Celestial Dragon who was redeemed by Yotohime during the Fishman Island flashback. It does not mention who this perpetrator was, but there is a good chance it could have perhaps been Jewelry Bonnie, as during a scene in Marijua we saw her sneaking in to help Kuma and cursing Saint Charles and his father for hurting Kuma, swearing she would make them pay, which likely ties into the attempted murder. But I do wonder if it really was her and how Saint Miosgard might have let her escape. Well, on the subject of Bonnie and Kuma, we still need to find out about their relationship and how they both connect to the South Blue's Sorbet Kingdom, which we know very little about. Kuma was the former king of the Sorbet Kingdom, oddly enough being famously known as Kuma the Tyrant despite his allegedly kind nature, and Bonnie was mistaken for Connie, the queen dowager of the Sorbet Kingdom. Is Connie Bonnie's real identity or perhaps that of someone she heavily resembles like her mother? After all, among Oda's notes that were published with Bonnie's designs, there was a note that claimed that Bonnie wanted to ask Vegapunk to return her father to normal, which could imply she is Kuma's daughter, although this could have been a scrapped idea, so we don't know for sure. Regardless, Bonnie and Vegapunk are almost certainly destined to meet, as she stated by the end of Marineford that she wanted to go after Vegapunk to make him pay for what he did to Kuma. Of which, by the way, we still need to find out why Kuma willingly sacrificed himself to become a human robot and what the real plan and purpose behind this was. Is perhaps the Revolutionary Army working with Vegapunk to use the Pacifista project with its newest incarnation, the Seraphim, against the world government? Speaking of the Shichibukai, the final big matter of the reverie was how Fujitora used King Cobra and King Riku to help make an argument for the disbandment of the Shichibukai, offering Vegapunk Seraphim project within this special sense group or SSG as a very literal replacement. This has been Fujitora's end goal for a very long while, but is there a reason for it beyond just disliking the corruption of the Shichibukai system that the government brought, or is it something else? Regardless, this disbandment put several of the Shichibukai in different precarious situations. 
First, Crocodile took the opportunity and founded Cross Guild with Mihawk, with Buggy being accidentally pinned as the leader and becoming a Yonko. Speaking of which, did Buggy ever find the legendary treasure of x Rocks member Captain John he had been looking after for so long? Luffy gifted him Captain John's compass during Impel Down, so did he manage to find that treasure and will said treasure actually become relevant to the story? Then, Hancock survived the invasion of Amazon Lily, but wishes to not endanger the island any further, so she has to find somewhere to go. Will she go to Luffy or somewhere else? Weevil and Bakin have yet to really play the role in the story, the former being interested in Whitebeard's inheritance and wishing to go after Marco because of it, even though Marco already confirmed that Whitebeard put all the money into his home village on Sphinx Island. Weevil himself instead is more interested in taking revenge against Blackbeard for killing his alleged father. It's also important to remember that Bakin was stated to be a member of the Rocks alongside Whitebeard 40 years ago. The Flamingo is stuck at the bottom of Impel Down, meanwhile, but he claimed that assassins from above, likely the Cypher Pole, were coming to assassinate him to keep his mouth shut, but that Magellan had kept him in a protected, isolated cell. This is because the Flamingo knows about the existence of the national treasure of Marie Joie, its existence able to shake the world to its core which Chapter 906 implied it likely was the large straw hat in the freezing room. Also, very quickly, a lot of people get the misconception that it's a giant or even ancient giant straw hat, but while it's mildly bigger than Luffy's, it's actually not that big when using the bounty posters for reference. And finally, Moria was last seen at Hachinosu when he went after Blackbeard for killing Absalom and giving his fruit to Shiliu. But Teach offered him to join his crew, so we'll have to see if Moria will accept the offer or he did something else entirely. On the subject of Blackbeard, we had been told his crew has been hunting for devil fruits, having found a method to steal them from people by killing them, which the Ace manga implied is the reason why Teach had to kill Thatch to take this fruit. Though we only know of a few of them among the crew aside from Blackbeard. Shiliu has Absalom's invisibility fruit, Katarina Kdevon has a Kyubi no Kitsune fruit, which allows her to turn into a nine-tailed fox that can take any form from Japanese folklore, San Juan Wolf has confirmed to have a fruit that allows him to increase his size, hence why even having been born as a giant he can be so colossal, and Lafitte has some sort of power that gives him angel-like wings. As for Burgess, Augur, Pizarro, Shot, and Doc Q, we still don't know what fruits they could be getting. There is also the fact that despite these being Blackbeard's 10 titanic captains, we only know of 9 of them, with the 10th one still being a mystery. It's possible this could perhaps be Kuzan, who was said to have allied with Blackbeard for some sort of purpose, though we don't know his true motives. As for Blackbeard himself, he is certainly a black box of mysteries, as there's the matter of how he was able to eat two devil fruits, which was attributed to a certain weird aspect of his body. This likely has to do with the fact that Blackbeard lives twice what normal people do, as Ace once put it in a chapter, as he's someone who never sleeps. There's a bunch of popular theories that tie to this, particularly relating to the imagery of the Three Skulls, also shared with Ors and a certain other devil, but we don't really have anything concrete yet. There's also his connection with the infamous Rox de Jebec, the previous ruler of Hachinosu Island, and also the namesake of Blackbeard's current sheep, the Saber of Jebec, indicating that there is some sort of connection between the two, as there's also the parallel with them being Roger and Luffy's rivals, making you wonder just how much Blackbeard really knows about the true history, since he seems privy to certain details. On the opposite side is Shanks, who, although we finally got to see a lot more of him in Film Red this year, still has to play his ultimate role in the story. We have yet to know more about his true intentions and plans, his past, and, without going into detail, these secrets that were revealed in Film Red. We also have yet to find out who the pirate that Shanks wanted to mention to the Gorosei really was, as well as if he really is the father of Makino's baby like Oda implied in an SPS. Also was the wedding he attended during the cover story his, despite Makino not being there considering that she does wear a wedding ring now, or was it someone else's? Let's also quickly go over a bunch of other characters who are also likely to return in the story. First, we need to see how the Gurma cover story will conclude and how it will tie back into the story. There's the matter of the two silhouettes we saw at Chocolate Town, which we know are not Ichiji and Reiju, who are instead at Whole Cake Island, but someone separate. There's also the matter of if someone like Pecums, or god forbid no, Pedro, no, 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 will reappear in the cover story too. We don't know if Garp will get involved in the story any further, but there's the question of what connection he has with the Celestial Dragons that has been brought up in the story. 
Is it perhaps related with Luffy's mother or grandmother? Will we actually see her at all in the story? Relating to him, Monkey D. Dragon undoubtedly will have to play some sort of role in the story as the leader of the Revolutionary Army. What are his Delaford powers? Are they really just the Kaze Kaze no Mi or Win Win Fruit? Or is it really something more specific? Also, though him being the most wanted man in the world is actually a mistranslation that gets spread around a lot, with his real epithet being the world's worst criminal just like the worst generation, what is his current bounty? Other bounties we also need to find out are Roger's commanders such as Rayleigh, Shanks' commanders, Blackbeard's commanders, and a few others. Enel is a major character who managed to make it to the moon in his cover story and attained an army of automata, clockwork dolls, and is ready to proceed with his ambition, which, oddly enough, a professor at Vekapang's homeland of Katakuri Island seemed to have identical blueprints of those automata for some reason. When will Enel come back into the story and how? Also, Luchi, Kaku, as well as Bluno and Khalifa now have joined CP0, but it's likely at this point that the other CP9 members might have as well. The question is if they'll still play a role in the story at this point. We've already talked about Bonnie, but the only other supernova that still needs to be relevant to the story is the ever-reckless Uruz, who has never really done much yet in the story, and the last time we saw him was resting at the balloon terminal where he briefly encountered Kaido. In terms of other supernovas, Beja's cover story is pretty much perfectly wrapped up and that just kinda wraps up his character arc, though he still may make a brief appearance during the final battle of the series, as might also Kid and Law. And there's also the question of what exactly Apu is going to do now. Hawkins seemed to be dead, but we need to know whether Drake is still alive or not, since Sword didn't seem to be able to get in contact with him. Speaking of which, Sword also is likely to play a role, since Oda recently confirmed what was believed that they are rivals to CP Aegis Zero, since the Aegis refers to a shield from Greek mythology, with a sword and shield clashing against each other. What are Sword's true intentions, how secretive really is this division, and who is its leader? Leader. Could this tie with Akainu's tattoo? And how will this all factor into Kobe's kidnapping at Blackbeard's hands? On the other hand, Smoker and Tashigi were taking the kids from Punk Hazard to Vegapunk to help them revert back to normal, which they seem to have succeeded in in the latest chapter, but what will be Smoker's next plan of action now that he is the commander of G5? Who was the man who Crocus met on the cover of chapter 631? Was it the former captain of the Rumber Pirates, Calico Yorki, who managed to survive the disease from 50 years ago during his youth? Or is it someone else entirely? Also, will Gin ever reappear? No. Gin is dead, it's time to move on. And of course, very importantly, there's the matter of the Grand Fleet. Cavendish, Sai, Ideo, and Orlambus are just sailing around, Bartolomeo provoked Shanks' territory, which Shanks wanted to take care of, Leo was last seen at the Reverie, and Hyrodin from the new giant warrior pirates alongside his childhood friends from Elbaf after quitting Bali's delivery. These seven captains were said they will get involved in an incident of historic proportions, which is likely to be the conflict at the climax of the series at this point. After all, Oda has done much to hype up the final saga, and in particular, talked about a certain lurking legend that he has mentioned was introduced in the manga during the serializing year of 2018, and said that they had a connection to Whitebeard. This pretty much narrows it down to only either Rock's Digibag or alternatively perhaps King Emu. These two characters are undoubtedly connected in some form or another, as they were literally introduced in the story back to back during the reverie. Rocks de Jebek wanted to be king of the world, word by word the same position King Emu currently has, and was involved with an island that was erased from the map, just like Emu did with Lalasha. This all ties, of course, to the God Valley incident, what the island was, and why the celestial dragons were there. There's also the matter of Kaido's Uo Nomi being originally there, and how the Viver cards mentioned that the Celestial Dragons have an obsession with the fictional dragon creatures, which is likely why the fruit was on the island, and why they asked Vegapunk to create artificial dragons too. On the topic of Emu, there's also the question of if or when the Gorosei will play into the story, as in a recent interview, Oda stated that they have not yet shown the real value. 
It's also important to remember regarding the hype of the final saga that Oda has already confirmed that he always planned to end the series when the One Piece is found, a finale that he has always had in mind since the beginning of the series and that he even stated recently he plans not to change at this point, meaning that we are only going to find out in the final few chapters. A lot of people seem to have this fact mixed up based on Whitebeard's final words, but closer inspection will indicate that Whitebeard never stated that the One Piece will lead into the final word, but actually that the final word will happen and then the One Piece will be found, turning the world upside down, the current system upside down like many characters have said in the series, something that Oda already confirmed in his recent interview. There's also the fact that Oda stated he wants to end the series with a massive party, which might also possibly tie with Luffy's true deem, though obviously that's just my own speculation here. And as we go into the finale of the story, will we also see all the Straw Hats accomplishing all their dreams? However, before we get to that point, there's quite a few places we need to visit first. For starters is Egghead, homeland of Vegapunk, which will no doubt shine light on the scientist, as well as Kuma and Bonnie, and perhaps Frankie. I would also said that when a certain professor, implicitly Vegapunk, appears in the story, we'll finally find out the truth of Dalfruits. This will likely tie into more details about the truth of the bloodline elements and what Vegapunk has been able to achieve with the cloning of Dalfruits and the creation of artificial life with the Seraphim. Next, Elbeth is an almost obligatory destination at this point, with Usopp having wanted to go there after meeting Brogy and Dory. There are several mysteries surrounding Elbaf, such as the massive tree-like structure at the center of the island, the faint outline of a second structure seen in the sky from the island, and Lola's suitor Prince Loki, who is certain to make an appearance as well. Some also wonder if Elbaf could have ties to the kingdom of ancient times, given their adoration for the sun in their mythology, refusal of the world government, and unique species. There's also the matter of the final road poneglyph, which was originally at Fishman Island but has since gone missing in the last 26 years. Kid hinted at that a certain man referred to as Hinokizu or Firescar knew about it, but who is this person really? Is it someone we know or a new character? Are there really any other locations we'll visit too? Will we ever hear of Vira, the Emerald City, the Island of Dreams Nakroa? Will we get to Lodestar? And ultimately, where is Laugh Tale? There's a certain line that Inrashi mentioned in Chapter 820 claiming that Crocus wouldn't lie about the fact that Laugh Tale is in fact at the end of the Grand Line's lock pose, something that he did in Dent Mansion during Reverse Mountain. This would suggest that Lowstar and Laftair are in the same location, or at least very close by, but the real details behind this statement are yet far from clear. This leads us to the final thing we need to cover, and that is the remaining major mysteries of the story. Starting off with the Egghead Island arc, Vekapang needs to tell us what Delfruits really are. How do they work by tying into the bloodline elements, and just who or what originally created them? Could it perhaps have been or have related to the Devil King that Shanks mentioned in Chapter 19, and did they really exist? Furthermore, why do Zoan fruits contain a will of their own? In Road to Laftale, Oda mentioned how Zoan awakenings result in the animal's will within the fruit slowly taking over the user, which is why the Impel Down Jailer guards became brood monsters or why Luffy began laughing when awakening. But what more is there to these? And of course, just who exactly was the Sun God Nika? Considering this is a mythological fruit, it means Nika never really existed, but was it based on the image of the former Joy Boy? And who exactly was really Joy Boy, and what role did they play in the Void Sentry? What is the real name beyond this title? Was it perhaps Nika, or Binks, or both? What was the true nature of the Great Kingdom from ancient times that Joy Boy was likely affiliated with, and what were its ideals that the world government was so scared that they tried to wipe them out from history? These are likely ideals of equality, freedom, and joy that tie with the grander themes of One Piece, but I'm sure we'll find out more details soon enough. Speaking of these ideals, though we can grasp a good understanding of what inherited will is, that one's dreams are inherited when someone dies, will it be explored more thematically with the Great Kingdom's inherited ideals? As after all, Whitebeard said that someone, a new Joy Boy, would arise to inherit will from 800 years ago to challenge the world to a fight. 
This is likely the very important will of D, but again, is there more to it beyond just those ideals of freedom and liberation? And of course, what does the D in the D clan stand for and what entails being a member of the clan? And why was this clan referred to as the fateful clan? What exactly is the power of fate and how does it relate with this clan? Do these ideals tie together with the alleged destruction of the world that the ancient weapons are capable of bringing? Is the popular theory of the destruction of the Red Line and the Grand Line turning into the All Blue going to play out by the end of the series? Will this help fulfill Charlie's prophecy that a man wearing a straw hat will help bring the destruction of Fishman Island and also fulfill the Noir Ark's purpose in its promise with Joy Boy to likely help the Fishman emigrate to the surface thanks to the help of Poseidon? Will we see Pluton unleashed when Momo and Zunisha decide to open the borders of Wano and is it actually a giant battleship? And what of Uranus? Is it the weapon that Emu used to wipe Lelusha or are we yet to see it in the story? Is it the egg on the Oro Jackson tied to all this? Considering that a One Piece magazine alluded to the egg hosting a creature the size of a Sea King? And what of the shadows of the Florian Triangle? Were they just there as a nod to thriller movie endings or will they play into the story? So, so many questions yet, but above them all lays one final critical question. The question that we've been waiting 25 years to find out about and that we will only find out once the series reaches its conclusion. What is the One Piece? All of this and more will be finally answered at last in the final saga of One Piece.